thanks to Notion for sponsoring this video. Get your free personal account at the link in the description. In this video, we are looking at the planets of Warhammer 40,000 to establish which ones could really exist. Is this the dorkiest thing I've ever done on this channel? Yes. Does this make my inner geek and multiple army collecting self squeal with joy? Also, yes. As before, I'm joined by Dr. Hannah Wakeford of the Astrophysics Department, University of Bristol, to combine her planetary expertise with my atmospheric knowledge. This is part two. In part one, we looked at planets from Terra to Tanith and found that most of them could really exist. If you enjoyed this video, then you should go give that one a watch too. Well, if you've already seen it, then welcome back, Inquisitor. For now, we return to the fray at Cadia. Cadia was the gate to the Eye of Terror, a temperate fortress world that held back the tide of chaos until it didn't anymore. Abaddon, or Abaddon the Despoiler, destroyed the planet by ploughing an immense spaceship called a Blackstone Fortress into its surface. For once, we're not so interested in the planet itself, but rather its demise. Can you actually destroy a planet with a forceful enough impact? Well, yes. These simulations are from a researcher called Jacob Kiegereis, looking at collisions between planets in their early stages of formation, when they're just protoplanets. What you'll notice is that when collisions occur on this sort of scale, planets don't really behave as a solid object. In fact, they actually behave much more like a fluid. Depending on the angle of impact, the density of the impacting object and its velocity, the target planet can become a collection of rocky debris, have ejecta spread all over its surface, or even have its molten core split in two. We may actually have to thank such a collision for our very existence. We mentioned earlier that the Earth having such a large moon may have given rise to life itself through tidal effects. And the moon might actually only be there because of a colossal impact in the Earth's past. One hypothesis is that around 4.5 billion years ago, Earth was struck by a Mars-sized object, and that impact caused a huge amount of rock to be ejected from Earth into space that later formed the Moon. Returning to our discussion of the comet struck Valhalla, transferring as much momentum as would be required to shift a planet's orbit via collision would just pulp the planet and cause a huge loss of its atmosphere to space. Destroying a planet through collision, though? absolutely possible. And while we're considering planet death, let's look at another world that was famously raised, Istvan III. Here, at the start of the Horus Heresy, the planet, a relatively standard temperate world, had its entire atmosphere set alight, consuming the whole planet in a firestorm that killed some 8 billion people near instantly. God, I love 40k! The question here is, can a whole atmosphere be ignited? This is something that's actually been calculated for the Earth. When the Manhattan Project was developing nuclear devices, there was a very real concern that the temperatures reached on detonation would cause the atmosphere to spontaneously combust. Calculations by Edward Teller and Emil Konopinski in the amazingly titled Ignition of the Atmosphere with Nuclear Bombs showed that no matter how much you heat the atmosphere, it can't start a self-propagating chain reaction. So just sparking the atmosphere is not enough. You have to add fuel. Now that is exactly what the traitors did at Istvan 3. They used a virus bomb to render the biomass on the planet down to methane and corpse gases in mere minutes, then ignited the newly flammable air from orbit. <laughs> There's around 500 billion tonnes of carbon in the Earth's biosphere, so that's all animals, plants, microorganisms, everything that's living on the planet. So if we were to somehow perfectly convert all of the Earth's biomass to methane, then according to my rough calculations, you would certainly have enough oxygen to set it on fire, it would only burn around 1 1,000th of all the oxygen in the atmosphere, but it would only burn if the gas remained in the lowest 50 metres or so of the atmosphere. Methane only ignites when at least 5% by volume of air, and filling the bottom 50 metres of the atmosphere with methane just about reaches this 5% threshold. That's a problem, however, when methane is less dense than air, and so would be rapidly spread out amongst the bottom 10 kilometers or so of the atmosphere by the tropospheric circulation. So using Earth as a proxy for Istvan 3, even with the most generous assumptions about how effective the virus bombs would be, the production of methane across the whole planet would almost certainly be too thinly spread to produce flammable air in anything other than a couple of hotspots. Obviously, this is looking at Earth, not Istvan, but Fortunately for the Loyalists, it seems Horus would have been a little less effective in reality. Istvan III's death could not have happened, as described. That's enough hypothetical though, let's consider an actual planet. An actual. 
an actual pla- <laughs> Guys! We're on Katachan. It's Space Vietnam, where everything wants to eat you. So I guess, basically... G'day mates, and welcome to Katachan. I'll be your tour guide today. Just make sure you watch out for the Venus man traps, the Katachan devils, the blood wasps, oh, and uh, the flying swamp mambas. Hopefully this afternoon before the barbie we'll see some of the great barking toads, or as I like to call them, chazwazers. But uh, be careful, if you touch them, they, they will explode, and they will kill you. Being a planet-wide jungle specifically, Katachan actually makes more sense than Tanif, our previous planet-wide forest, and the simple reason for that is water. Biomes can be defined by how warm and how wet the local environment is. We previously said that homogeneous climates would make sense if there was a thick atmosphere that evenly distributed equatorial heat around the planet. That circulation would also distribute moisture, and on a uniformly warm planet with liquid water on the surface, there would be plenty of water vapour held in the air. As air gets warmer, it can store more water in the form of vapour. So a planet that has a thick atmosphere at the right distance from its star would both be warm all over and wet all over. And when those conditions combine, you get rainforests. And when you get enough rainforests, you get enhanced evaporation, adding more moisture to the atmosphere. This in turn can cause a rise in sea levels, covering more of the planet in water, which leads to more evaporation and so on. It is a positive feedback loop. The wildlife being so dangerous could also make sense, as with such a crowded ecosystem, as we see in Earth's jungles, animals engage in an arms race to compete for resources. When the planet is one huge jungle, teeming with life, the competition for resources is fierce. Much like the whole galaxy, really. It even has the skeletons. In fact, Katachan is not a million miles away from Earth during the Jurassic period, when CO2 concentrations were so high, around two and a half times current concentrations, that there was very little difference between equatorial and polar temperatures. There were plenty of shallow seas, dense forests and rainforests, even at the poles, and, of course, plenty of animals that would kill you and everyone you love. So yeah, Katachan is possible. A million miles from Earth, both physically and metaphorically, is Port Moor, one of the most important harbours of the Imperial Navy. It's not really a planet at all, but more of an enormous space station, possibly constructed and then abandoned by the Necrons. The really distinctive thing about Port Moor is the fanged mouth that runs across the centre of the planetoid, rendering the interior of the entirely hollow structure accessible and defensible. Sources list the mouth as being 500 kilometers wide, which if we interpret to mean its longitudinal width, Port Moore would have a radius of around 160 kilometers. So this is a pretty small object in terms of planets, but vast in terms of spaceships. It's bigger than the Death Star, for goodness sake. In the past, we discussed Nowhere, a similar spaceport in the MCU, but unlike Port Moore, that was built from the skull of a celestial and was much smaller in scale. We previously ruled that Nowhere could possibly exist because we don't know the exact material properties of the skull. Similarly, we don't know what material Port Moore is made of, likely Necrodermis or similar, but the sheer scale of the object means that the gravitational effects of its asphericity will be much greater. See our MCU video for more details about what that means. For a material to be strong enough to hold this shape while also being light enough to not produce a catastrophically destructive gravitational field, especially considering that it doesn't have spherical symmetry like a Dyson sphere, it would have to have properties completely unlike any metal we yet know about. For that reason, I am going to have to say that it couldn't exist. If we came across this world tomorrow, I'm pretty sure that whatever material it's made of would break some of the laws of physics. The Primarch who broke all laws of social etiquette was Mortarian, who you could definitely smell before you saw. Oh, However, considering that old Morty grew up on the world of Barbarous, this makes sense. The planet had a horrific atmosphere, and I don't mean as if someone at a party just admitted that they play Tau. The atmosphere on Barbarous was only breathable very close to the surface. As you got higher, reaching out of the valleys where the population lived, virulent, toxic gases increased in concentration and would quickly overwhelm any human. This is an interesting idea, but there are some physical problems with this. There are basically two ways that we can have distinct chemical layers in an atmosphere above the surface. The first is the stratosphere. 
Hello! The stratosphere is a unique layer in the Earth's atmosphere where temperature increases with altitude, which results in the air there lying in flat layers on top of one another. This means that if you inject something to the stratosphere, such as with a volcanic eruption, it gets circulated around on these flat layers, but basically stays up there. On Barbarus, if there was a source of these toxic gases in the stratosphere, then they would stay up there basically permanently. The problem is, the stratosphere starts much higher up than halfway up a valley. At its lowest on Earth, it's maybe six or seven kilometers above the surface. If Barbarus' sun emitted more UV than our sun does, then maybe its stratosphere would be lower, but its star is described as weak and yellow, which if anything would mean it would emit less UV radiation and so the stratosphere would be higher. So this seems a very unlikely explanation. The other section in the Earth's atmosphere, where layers of different gases are stacked on top of one another, is in the heterosphere. This is where convection and mixing are less important than diffusion of molecules by their different weights, so you get layers of the heaviest gases on the bottom and the lightest gases on top. Below the heterosphere, everything is basically mixed together equally in what's called the homosphere. However, the boundary between these two layers, the turbopause, is at about 100 kilometers above the surface, much higher than the stratosphere and the heterosphere contains just one thousandth of a percent of all the mass in the atmosphere. So Barbarus isn't going to have its dense lower atmosphere explained by a heterosphere. In fact, Barbarus' atmosphere is kind of the opposite of how we experience pollution on Earth. When you see pictures like this of smog hanging over a city, it's caused by what's called a temperature inversion. Just like in the stratosphere, where an air temperature increases with height, which it can for a variety of reasons, it stops vertical movement of air, and this traps pollution in a layer underneath the cooler air above. This is often seen in cities in valleys, such as Salt Lake City. So Barbarus's polluted upper atmosphere, rather than lower atmosphere, is the opposite of what we expect from this temperature inversion phenomenon. If Barbarus had a permanent temperature inversion close to the surface for some bizarre reason, and the source of the pollution was above this layer, then conceivably there would be a habitable lower section of the atmosphere rapidly meeting this toxic layer. But I just don't think it's possible for such a sharp division to permanently exist in the homosphere, where everything is mixed together. So fortunately, I'm going to say that Barbarus couldn't exist. We're going to have to include at least one weeb world or we'll get overwatched to death. When we asked on Reddit for suggestions for this video, one name that kept coming up was Tinek La. Uh, Hannah? Tinek La was originally a huge mineral structure with a thin crust. The Tau Earth cast then got their fishy little hands on it and used their advanced technology to carve it into an enormous truncated icosahedron, a mix of hexagons and pentagons approximating a sphere. The planet-sized crystal is described as being so close to true transparency it seems to glow with lambent starlight. Crystals appear transparent when they have no fractures or impurities, such as transitional elements, in them. So for a crystal to grow to the size of a planet, it would need to form in some pretty exceptional circumstances, under a great deal of pressure, over a long period of time, and in a stable environment without extra elements floating around. One possibility for such an environment is the core of a planet. At the centre of gas giants like Jupiter, the pressure and temperature can be immense, and depending on the material present in the planet, crystal formation seems likely. One hypothetical origin for a world like Tinic La is a low-density planet that gradually formed crystals in its solid core and subsequently lost its atmosphere and outer layers to intense radiation from its star. We see this process happening with some exoplanets such as GJ3470b, which is slowly losing its hydrogen-helium envelope due to pressure from the star. This would leave behind a large crystal core, which could then potentially later accrete a thin crust, as tinic glass seems to have done. However, in such circumstances, there would still be plenty of other elements kicking around in the planet, and so the resulting crystal wouldn't be transparent at all. And in fact, there's no evidence to suggest that such large crystals could form anywhere in nature. So much as planets could have their outer layers stripped away to leave a core behind, one exactly like the crystalline tinic lar does not seem possible. But enough xenos and traitorous filth. Let's go back to the Sol system to finish off this video and examine two worlds at the heart of the Imperium. And Hannah is pretty excited to talk about the homeworld of the Grey Knights. Titan, woo! 
Titan is one of the most fascinating worlds in our solar system. It is the only moon to harbor a stable atmosphere. In fact, the atmosphere is denser than the Earth's at 1.4 times the pressure at the surface. Titan's atmosphere, like Earth's, is nitrogen-based in that it is mostly made of nitrogen. But all the other gunk in Titan's atmosphere is not O2, but methane. It actually also has a methane cycle, much like our water cycle here on Earth, a methane cycle on Titan rains down forming lakes and seas and then evaporates and rains down again. The surface of Titan is cold, just 90 degrees above absolute zero, and the surface itself is formed of ice. It is formed of water ice and every mountain and feature you see there is an ice mountain. This lithosphere is then sitting on a layer of liquid water which is itself on top of hot ice. Ice 6 which is formed when water is under immense pressure. Even in 40k, it seems that they basically threw in the towel and just accepted the environment of Titan as unchangeable, so kept it as a defense. After all, it's one of the more hellish environments for an enemy to try and attack, and that's before you even account for the chapter of Mary Sue, Goody Two-Shoes, Harry Potter marines on the surface. Titan in 40k is basically the Titan we know today, so it could definitely exist. I love Titan, it's such an amazing world, and I can see why they chose it for the planetary science fun alone. Crazy little marines. Our final world though, returning closer to home, is very different to what we see in the present day. Mars. God damn it, I love toasters. Mars is the home world of the Adeptus Mechanicus, the tech support of the Imperium, and a colossal power in their own right. In the 41st millennium, Mars is a forge world with a population of some 20 billion souls and an unspecified number of Catan. Let's take a look at the differences between Mars now and Mars then. Firstly, it's missing a moon. Deimos was relocated over Titan to act as a massive mine and later fortress for the Grey Knights, so Yep, there's that. Secondly, the Ring of Iron, a huge complex of orbital facilities, probably the largest man-made structure in the galaxy, effectively a series of tethered space stations that ring the entire planet. And terraforming. Mars had been colonized for tens of thousands of years by M41, and was previously entirely terraformed to be a verdant world. However, when the Mechanicum took control of the planet, they totally disregarded the environment and wrecked the atmosphere in their quest for greater industrial and military production. The question of terraforming Mars has been considered for years, from as soon as it became clear that the planet was extremely hostile to human life in its current form. The verdict is still out on whether it's actually possible to make Mars habitable, partly due to the energy that is required to release enough greenhouse gas to warm the surface. Yes, you could use nukes, Musk, but you really, really wouldn't want to. But also it's going to be difficult because of the lack of magnetosphere on Mars. And the magnetosphere is important because it would shield it from the solar wind. We can't kickstart the planet's core to give it this new magnetosphere, and any magnetic shielding from space would only be partially effective. Though, in the past, we've ruled that extremely advanced technology can accomplish a great deal, and seeing as Mars is the home of the biggest Komsky nerds in the galaxy, let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say they would be able to terraform the planet. But would they consciously wreck an entire planet and ruin its atmosphere? No, that, that's just too far-fetched. Oh. Oh yeah. The other standout feature of the Forge world is the Ring of Iron. If you have a galaxy-wide empire to draw on, then you could definitely build something this big. And it being an equatorial ring means that dynamically it makes sense. Provided, of course, that it wasn't rigid. James Clark Maxwell showed that if a planet had a solid, rigid ring, it would be unstable and tear itself apart. So the Ring of Iron would need to have compensating mechanisms and mechanics in different ways to avoid this. Together with sufficiently strong material to tether it to the equator, it seems like the Ring of Iron could exist, and so the Forge World Principle could too if we're being super generous. And there we are. Of the 18 planets considered, 10 could probably exist in our galaxy. And oh boy, would we be worse off for having any of them. Next though, we should consider which forms of heresy could really exist. So far we've now looked at planets from 40k, Star Wars and the MCU, and we've seen a wide variety of planets. 40k might actually showcase some of the coolest kinds of planets yet, including tidally locked worlds, as well as my favorite moon, Titan. What sci-fi universe should we look at next though? Firefly? Stargate? 
Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Bonus points if you can find a sci-fi universe with a hot Jupiter. There are so many more kinds of exoplanets that we never seem to get represented in sci-fi and we would love to take a look at some more. The universe is really strange and we still have yet to scratch the surface on these videos. Yeah, let's see. Yep, can definitely check that one off. Must remember to do that later. Buy incense. In case you're wondering, this is how I produce and organize my videos. Each one has a page in my database and has custom assets that allow me to keep track of, for example, video type, status, and target date. My video database is only part of my personal notion. I use this same free software to keep track of my weekly to-do lists, yearly planning, and what bits of plastic crack I'm gonna buy next. Notion is kind of like a life OS, a software version of Lego bricks that you can use to construct whatever system you want for your specific needs. Students can use Notion to help organize their notes, teams can use Notion to coordinate tasks, and couples can use it to plan their weddings, to a completely sane level of detail. If you like how someone else has configured their Notion, then it's super easy to duplicate their system into your own, and almost all of my various systems started life this way. Customization is super easy, and one of my favorite things about Notion. Best of all though, personal accounts used to be $5 a month, but are now free. Forever. Notion has been an absolute game changer for my productivity, my organization, and my general mental health, and I would honestly recommend it to absolutely anyone. Especially now that you can get a personal account for free, there is no reason to not give it a go. Sign up at the link in the description for your free personal account and unlock your productive potential. It really is that good. Thanks to Notion for sponsoring and helping me organize this video. Thank you so much for watching this video. As with part one, this was a mammoth task that would not have been possible without the unending support of Magos Hanna. Do check out the description for a link to her website and to her research. Thanks must also go to Jungle Fighter Rimi and to Tech Priest Spiffing Brit for lending me their voices and to Servitor Simon Lee for fact checking some of the script. If you enjoyed this video, please do pop it a like and give it a share in your hobby group chat. That just leaves me to say thank you so much again for watching and as always, the Emperor protects.